Hey everybody, thank you for joining us this Sunday morning for our live stream worship. We apologize for running into some technical difficulties, uh, but we hope that you are able to find it. If not, uh, we are posting this on our website, so if you're watching it later, I uh, hope you enjoy as well and are able to still worship with us this Sunday. Uh, my name is Kevin Perry. I'm the youth director here at Lifeway, and I just wanted to first say thanks and welcome to our live stream church. Uh, we are so excited and glad that you're able to join with us today as we worship together as a family, as a local body of Christ. Um, today we're going to hear from Billy from uh, a few different passages in scriptures, Psalm 1 and Isaiah 17. Uh, and then we're also going to be worshiping together um, with Chris Berry and Rachel Perry uh, leading us in some musical worship. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just turn it over to Billy now for that. So thanks for, for joining us again. If you have any questions, feel free to check out our website, lifewayconnect.com, or you can follow us on Facebook uh, and, and find us there. Thanks. So good morning, everyone. Billy Arnold here, uh, Lifeway Church. Already we've had these technical difficulties that Kevin talked about, and he also had a difficulty in quoting the passages that I'm going to be speaking out of. It is going to be Psalm 1, but it's also going to be Jeremiah 17, not Isaiah 17. Okay, with all the little confusion and panic we've had in the room, uh, the five of us that are here this morning, uh, it's been a little bit nutty. So uh, I want to thank you all for, again for joining us as well. Why do we worship this way? Uh, we worship this way, but the obvious is that around the world there's chaos, and it's been difficult to try to figure out how do you connect? How do you pray? How do you get together and socialize in a world of of social distancing and that sort of thing. Uh, we are grateful for the technology, even though uh, technology itself sometimes uh, becomes a bit of a headache for us, but we are just still grateful that we can connect in this kind of a way uh, as we are doing. So this morning, we are going to worship. So around your living room or your kitchen or wherever you happen to be today, some of you are even at your office, uh, you want you to just kind of treat this as a bit of a time a really a worship gathering, a time to gather together as God's people, connected in a bit of a unique way uh, as we share. At the very end of our service, uh, Chris Berry is going to give us a little instruction about how all of us at Lifeway can continue to participate uh, through prayer, through giving, and other kinds of things. But our worship time is really about honoring God, and it's about learning something from God. And again, I'm going to launch it here in a few minutes out of Psalm chapter 1, and I want you to go ahead now and just kind of get your Bibles, electronic Bibles or a paper Bible that you have in your home, and turn to Psalm 1 because we're going to be studying that for just a moment. But then we're going to sing, we're going to teach, we're going to sing some more, we're going to spend some time in prayer, uh, and uh, we're going to just honor God with our time together. So thank you for joining us, as Kevin and I both have, have stated, and we're just so glad to have you with us. Uh, I want you to join me in a prayer, if you would, uh, right now as we just honor God. Can we do that? Almighty God, um, literally, uh, as I often say, as we come into a room, uh, when we gather here in our Lifeway Church building, uh, I always think about the complexities of people's lives, even just for the people who gather in that room. And then now that we have this opportunity through technology and such to, to reach out into a whole different way around uh, our city, in our own church family that we call Lifeway, and then even beyond the people who call Lifeway home who might be sharing as a part of this, God, uh, there are issues going on in every one of our lives. So worries and concerns about the issues of today, worries and concerns about the issues of our economy, our health, uh, our jobs, our kids, our grandkids, uh, our lives, um, the world our friends that are scattered in different parts of the world. I myself have friends literally in China and Japan and in Russia and Portugal and East Africa and friends in Mexico who I dearly love and, and uh, Canada and places literally all over the United States and virtually uh, so many states. So I, 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 I know that they're all, we're all struggling with different kinds of things with our business and our home. God, Help us today and speak to us in ways that can bring a whole measure of truth. Not just comfort to make us feel better like a pill that makes us feel better, but real truth, which is why we worship. So God, you are the healer. You are the God of hope. You are the God of truth. You are the God of life. You're the God who, who brings a whole new joy to us that we could never know beyond our relationship to you. 
So thank you for our time together. We pray for healing of our land. We pray for our officials who are going to be leading us through a lot of huge decisions in our city, in our state, in our nation, and frankly, government leaders around the world who are making monumental decisions. Uh, but God, we know that you are still God on the throne, and we want to honor you for that and let this time of worship be for you today. Bring healing to our hearts, bring truth into our lives, and we lift this up in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to study the book of Psalm chapter 1. Uh, again, all of us are trying to get a little bit of a comfort level. Uh, I'm sitting here still a little bit. We were in a panic stage for about 15 minutes here trying to get things to work. So uh, a couple things as we were rushing through all of that first early part. I want us all to kind of relax, myself included, as we look into Psalm chapter 1. But I, I meant to do this to you too as well. Normally on a Sunday morning here at Lifeway, we kind of say, turn to your neighbor and give a greeting of some sort. Turn to your neighbor, shake a hand, or give a hug, or whatever it is. Well, obviously, if you're in their house, uh, turn, your, turn to somebody in your house, if somebody's with you, and give them a hug, or a handshake, or whatever. Uh, but if you're beyond all of that, maybe grab your telephone and send a text message to somebody right now and say, good morning, and welcome to Lifeway uh, and our service in that way. So, uh, But we're going to study together the book of Psalm. Uh, the two words I want to start off with is, is a word that we're using a lot in these days. It's the two words of isolation and insulation. Isolation meaning literally that time and that moment in time when we are uh, in the current world situation that's topsy-turvy, upside down, that when we're told to go home and save lives. I saw it this morning on a sign, and you see it in all kinds of posts that are around. Stay home, save lives. Insulate, isolate yourself. Um, it's a little crazy, and it's sort of that insulation and isolation, I think, sort of pulls out who we really are. Uh, interestingly enough, just a very few days ago, I had a personal visit with a uh, sheriff's department deputy, a local sheriff's department deputy, uh, through an incident that took place, and, and I was asking him, a uh, young guy, and I was asking him, what's, you know, what's life like right now as a police officer? as a, uh, a first responder, so to speak. And he said, well, it's a little crazy. But he had an interesting insight. He said, because so many people have been instructed, go home, stay indoors, and don't leave, and stay with your family if you have one, he said that um, the domestic violence issues are way, way up for him. He said every night he gets more and more calls all the time, he and the entire department, because of domestic violence issues, because the inner core of a person comes out Sometimes when you find yourself in kind of an insulated and uh, uh, isolated location, the real you kind of comes out, especially if there's no real depth. Actually, if there is depth or not depth, it sort of appears at that point. Psalm 1, I think, speaks to this in an unusual kind of a way. It's obviously the first of that very famous book, that poetic book in the Old Testament that's really often considered as a book of worship, a book of of meditation, reflection. It certainly has prayer times and times where you're wrestling with God and wrestling with the brokenness of yourself and the brokenness of humanity. Psalm is, 150 chapters of it is just full of that top to bottom, as well as high praise and depressing thoughts as well. But it starts off in Psalm 1 with this imagery that I want to point out. And it's really an imagery of two choices that a human being has to, can make in life. It's like, think of it this way, it's like a desert life as well as, or as opposed to, in verses, a life by a river. Uh, it's like a garden type setting in that way. There's two choices, Psalm 1. I want you to open your Bibles, if you haven't already, and read along with me in Psalm 1, verse 1. Uh, and whatever version you have, it should read very close to this in English. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step, in the step with the wicked. Or stand in the way that sinners take. Or sit in the company of mockers. Just stop there for a second. Look at that first verse. There's three postures that are there. There's that walking in step. Walking in step with whom? Walking in step with really, he calls him the wicked here. And that word, that Hebrew word, really means the intentional godless. The intentional person who says, I want nothing a part of God. Uh, and then it says, 
Now, we're not only walking in step with them, but we're standing in the path with the sinners. It's another echoing term, it says there. What does that mean? It's that, that sinner is that person who chooses to do their own thing. I'm my own volition. Kind of a Luke 15 prodigal son that says, I want my way, my how, any way I need to do it. That's what that kind of that, that picture of a sinner We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but it says you're standing in the path of the sinner, and then it says you're sitting in the company. It's like me sitting here. If I said I wanted to surround myself at a banquet table with who? It's with the mockers. Literally, I'm embedding myself. Uh, I am uh, I'm in, indulging a life with others who also want to be what? Mockers, self-indulged, independent from God, consumed, prideful in every way. Uh, but read on in verse 2, but the, the who's, uh, it, it, it says, but it, it, as it starts off, if you remember, blessed is the one who does not walk with these people, but instead in verse 2, but instead that person, what, delights in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. It's, it's the one who finds full pleasure and an enjoyment of a relationship to God. Um, my wife and I happen to have a brand new granddaughter. You know, I'll send you a, a picture if you want one. Just text me and I'll send one to you. She's the cutest little thing in the world. And of course, in this day of isolation, we're trying to figure out how does that mean with a grandchild. But she was just born. She's still over a week old. But we delight with the possibility of spending time with her. True delight. Now, that's a grandparent to a grandchild. But in the person who says, I want to follow God, it's like, like, oh, I'd rather be nowhere else than with him. That's the person he's talking about. That's the person one, person two. But he goes on and he said in verse three, that person is like a tree. With the person who delights in the Lord, that person is like, it's an illustration, an analogy. He's like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. Um, this can be best understood when you sort of visualize the desert. The, the Bible is written, of course, you know, a couple thousand years ago, and it, was most, it really comes mostly out of the Middle East. And in that Middle Eastern setting, you have the desert, and then you have the oasis, you have the rivers. Uh, you have these places of nothing and these places of nourishment. And the contrast is there. Now, in the Northwest, we don't quite have that same visual in our mind, especially those of us in Western Washington, you know, especially if you look at the last couple of days and even this morning, it's a bit wet and dreary outside and you can pretty much find rain anywhere, right? And wet and growing things everywhere. But in that same visual, you understand if you've ever walked across the desert and you finally find that oasis, it's the picture of this garden. It's the picture of a kind of a garden of Eden, quite honestly, uh, where the water flows in all of its right fashion. That person who delights in the Lord finds himself not in the desert, but next to the Almighty in life. And it goes on for verse 4, Not so the wicked, they are like chaff who blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Very heavy-handed words. That's all of Psalm 1 right there. I often play a game with, uh, I work a lot with students, uh, both American students as well as a lot of international students. And I'm in a program at our church at Life, what we call FIS, Friends of International Students. And I want to reach out to some of them. Some of them I think might be watching this morning, but uh, from different parts of the world. But the point is, in um, this game I play, I always say, visualize yourself and pick one of these four places you'd like to live. A lot of people have been around me, have heard me play this game. If you had a choice and you could live someplace for a year uninterrupted, where would it be? And I usually pick, find yourself either, number one, maybe in a Swiss chalet up in the mountains. Number two, in a Thomas Kincaid painting down by a, a lake with a, you know, with a little rowboat out in front of your cabin with a little fire burning up out of it. Number three, you could find yourself on a white sandy beach with blue water out in front of you and a little, you know, palm tree cabin kind of a thing. Or number four, maybe it is in a desert, a beautiful sunset desert, sunrise, sunset, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I always ask people, where would you rather be? And it's a fun game to play. Most of us answer that out of the sense of a life of busyness. We're crazy busy with school, studies, work, 
pressure from life, soccer games for our kids, and all the different kind of things. And we like to answer it as a result of, oh, I'm tired and exhausted. I'm so busy. I, I'd rather go to the White Beach. I'd rather go to the, you know, the, the Thomas Kincaid Lake by, with, the, with the rowboat on it. But, but now we find ourselves in a forced isolation. And you have to think, where would I really rather be? And I think when you answer that question, not just in a game fashion, you're finding out in your own insulated life that you're starting to lead right now, instructed to be out there on your own. You're finding yourself with a big question mark about your own life. Who am I really? What's really at the core of who I am? Uh, where am I going? And what am I really doing with my life? <clears throat> Not unlike that, uh, that county deputy sheriff's department uh, you know, sheriff uh, who, who was telling me that, you know, people when they get insulated and isolated, the core person of themselves really comes out. The real you emerges because there's not much else to lean on. Psalm 1 speaks of that. We live in now a BC world, not before Christ, but before the coronavirus, before COVID-19, BC and our lives of busyness. Now, granted, your company and your business may be swamped busy, but you live in a very different way than you've ever lived in before. And quite honestly, we don't know how long this, this is pushing back normal. We just don't know. Uh, but I, I wanted to point something out. Your life is abnormal right now, no matter what. It's a BC world for us. And it's really forcing you to live in an insulated and isolated way that you've never had before. And I want to pressure you, much like I did last week, challenge you to say, have you really considered who you really are deep down at your core? We've always made excuses about our life because of how busy we are and how many things we got to watch on this and that and the other and take care of. And all of a sudden, our world gets shrunk down to the core essence of some things. It's not unlike... When somebody says, why don't you get on the scale, a weight scale, and weigh yourself? And, and that bare you sort of steps up on the weights and says, ooh, I'm too heavy, or I'm too light, or I'm whatever. The real you comes out. Um, many years ago, I was shaped by a couple of books. One was a book named, uh, and, and I, my Bible is my easily favorite book to all read, but I do read beyond that. And one is a book by Francis Schaeffer, says, how, we, how, how should we then live? And it's a philosophical, uh, spiritual book, obviously, about really evaluating your life. And it meant a lot to me. And then Charles Colson, Chuck Colson, the Watergate investigator who became a believer, later on wrote a follow-up book to that. It says, How Now Shall We Live? And it was very powerful for me as it really helped examine the core of who I am. As he did for his life, it's who I am. And so I think this is the perfect time to examine the deeper sides of our lives, the real deeper self, the inner core of who I am. Uh, who are you deep down inside during those moments of quiet, those moments of jumping up on the scale and really measuring? Psalm 1 is really the tale of two people, I think. Much like the old book, uh, Tale of Two Cities, some of you might remember that. The tale of two persons, Person one is that wicked person. And you think, wicked? Well, we wicked. We know what wicked is. It's, right? You know, we all of us can picture a wicked person. It's that rapist. It's that murderer. And that's not, you know, the vast majority of us, that's not us. No, that's, that's not the full extent of what that means. That person is the shallow, the, the curse, the temporary. Later on, he calls him the, the chap. The wicked person is really that person who is that stubborn, that self-consumed, self-absorbed person who believes that they can build whatever life that they want to build or that they think they can build and that they are totally in charge. Uh, that's really a weird statement in the modern era, right? Who's really in charge here? And I'm not really in charge of anything. I thought I was in charge and... Three weeks ago, Chris and I were talking a while ago, three weeks ago, certainly four weeks ago, we were, the world was in charge, our government was in charge, our, you know, our systems were all in order, and literally, it, it's amazing what a fractional virus that is 
a, a billion times smaller, whatever that number is, than a human being, then one human being can literally capture not just America, not just my city, like a snow day, not just America, but literally the entire globe. I know friends all over the world, and the entire globe is captured by this. They're all writing me about this. Uh, the wicked person says, I got it. The, 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 I got this. That really, that wicked person really is somebody who says, I'm self-absorbed, self-consumed, and I'm self-in-control. That person is shallow. It's like the, 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 the shoot, the, the seed that grows up overnight, and then literally as soon as the heat of the day comes, it withers away quickly. Jesus talked about that. It's that human accomplishment of success, and the person who chooses to live that way of relying totally on that, that is someone who says, that is my God. My, uh, the, uh, I get to, to raise up the God that I want to in my own way. The true self of that person gets revealed in the, in the moment when the heat comes on, when the plague hits. The Bible calls that person the cursed, burned up in the fire, eliminated. It, it's, it, you know, uh, it's the, my world, my creation, my pleasures. Where does that end up? It's not unlike if you get a trophy, because I used to get some when I was a little kid. You're in grade school, and you get a, an awards trophy that sits on your shelf or whatever place that you happen to come in. And then later on, you know, in life, that little trophy gets tarnished and eventually it gets kind of thrown in the, in the trash heap. That's pretty much what the life is of a person who relies upon themselves. The Bible calls them, they're like the chaff. They are eliminated. Chaff, my grandfather was a farmer and he would raise up crops and certain kind of crops were the productive crops and all the other stuff that came within the, the bale, so to speak, were, was laid out there so that the wind could blow and literally drift all of that away. It becomes what? Nothing. Person two, that's person one. Person two is this, the blessed. That is the person that is the grounded, uh, the fruitful, the uh, deeply rooted we're not talking about that perfect person. I mean, being, being a pastor of a church, and I've been a pastor a long time, and, and, and we always say, oh, the person who goes to church. For crying out loud, we can't even go to church anymore right now. In some ways, I count this as a bit of a blessing because we're forced to think beyond going to church, and we're forced beyond just the attending of a building somewhere, and we're forced to think a lot more about who really am I down in my core. Uh not talking about just being a nice guy, a nice gal, but solidly grounded, who can hang, that kind of a person who hangs on to the only things that are true. That person's, that person who hangs on to the only truth of the Lord is, is an, makes a life investment that is, the Bible says, fruitful. In other words, in Psalm 1 it says, it's planted by the waters and when it's time to bear fruit, it bears fruit. It, it doesn't wait for the right conditions because the conditions are always right. That person is fruitful and that person is deeply rooted no matter what the circumstances of life come. One set of my grandparents used to live down in the Gulf Coast. I've shared this to all of you at Lifeway many times in the past, but it's a great classic story. They grew up, they lived on the coast, uh, the Gulf Coast of Texas. And one time a major hurricane came and they had these monster trees in their yard. And when the, eye, when the hurricane came and the wind was moving in one direction for the first time, that giant oak tree that was in their yard flattened to the ground. And the eye of the storm came over and the wind, as you know, in a hurricane came back the other direction. And guess what happened to that tree? It literally, the wind lifted that giant oak tree back up again. And that oak tree prospered. Why? Because that tree was deeply rooted. That's the kind of person that you and I are called to be. That's the kind of person, a person too, that Psalm 1 talks about. That, and so during this season of isolation and in insulation in your life, this is the perfect opportunity to examine yourself, take a deep, deep look inside, and see which of those people have you ever been in your life. That person 1, the Bible calls wicked, worthless, and chaff. And I don't mean to just call us wicked in the traditional sense of the word, but literally God-less. I got it. Or person two who says, no matter what, I'm deeply rooted in him. It's this contrast of a desert person and a desert life or a garden life. 
a person who chooses to live outside the Garden of Eden. If you read your Bible in, in the book of Genesis, it tells that classic story of the, the, the first created man and woman who lived in total relationship to God, where? In a garden, until they had to leave the garden. And they walked out of that relationship. And they were in their stubbornness of all of that. And guess what? They suffered the consequences. The consequences of a world that is broken, and it is constantly broken, even in moments when it has a little ease, and broil a broken relationship with the Almighty God, the Creator of all things. But we've now been given a chance to come back into the garden through our relationship to Jesus Christ. That's the Christian story. That's the Christ story. I believe that it is times of disasters that reveal the best to us. I want you to look in your Bibles very quickly to Jeremiah 17. Now, I'm going to read this for him. I'm going to say very little about it because I'm going to read it this time, not out of one of the traditional classic versions, but out of a paraphrase. It's called The Message. Now, it, the message I love and, and, and often read it, it's, it feels like a commentary of the actual words themselves. But this speaks to this. Jeremiah 17, a few hundred years after Psalm 1 was written, Jeremiah wrote it and he quotes Psalm 1 in these few verses. The literally in the time of Jeremiah the prophet, and the prophets, all the prophets are writing about total calamity all the time. In fact, you want to read about current events that are going on, read the prophets of the Bible. But in this case, he was preaching this and teaching this to the people of Israel because an invasion of an army was coming and there was uncertainty and the dysfunction of all of society as they had known it at that time. And, and they were worried and in panic with their money, with their food, with their livelihood, with their kids, their family, their health, everything. And he writes this and he quotes Psalm 1. Interestingly enough, I'm going to read this out of this. And he says, who do we rely on? Who are we supposed to rely on? The government? Hey, well, the government's gone. Our money? Our business? No, they're gone. What do we rely on? And look at this. This is Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. And I'm reading this out of the message. And it says, this is God's message. Cursed, listen to this carefully. Cursed is the strong one who depends on mere humans, who thinks that he can make it, make it on muscle alone. Now, this is the paraphrased message. He thinks he can make it on muscle alone and sets God aside as dead weight. He, he's like a tumbleweed on the prairie, out of touch with the good earth, he leads a rootless and aimless uh, life in a land where nothing grows. And then he quotes Psalm 1. But blessed is the man who trusts trust me, God, uh, in me, God, the woman who sticks with God. They are like trees replanted in Eden. That is the Garden of Eden, putting down roots near the rivers. Never worry, never a worry about the hottest summers, never dropping a leaf, serene and calm through the droughts, and bearing fresh fruit in every season. The invading of army is coming, folks. It's on its way. It's here. The enemy is at the gate, to kind of quote a, a movie title of the invasion of Stalingrad from Hitler's Nazi army. Uh, the perfect storm has arrived, quoting another movie, of when the, the wind comes from all different kinds of directions and you get caught in the crosshairs of it. And frankly, you don't have control hardly over almost anything. But you have a choice. You could be the person one or person two. You could be a person one who ends up relying upon the things that you accumulate and you'll be like the chaff. Or you can be person two who just says, I'm going to trust in the eternal God and I can be the fruitful God. How do you survive? I think you survive by literally saturating, begin the exercise of saturating your life in Him, in the truth of the Almighty, in the Word of God. Take your Bibles, folks. I often tell people, I say this all the time, my sermons are, and teachings are never to be to remember what I've taught you, but to point you toward the one thing that will last, and that is the Word of God. So I've given you Psalm 1 this morning. I've given you Jeremiah 17. I didn't read that whole chapter. You want to find out who you are. It's pertinent, even though it's written from 25, 2700 years ago. It's real today. And I want to give you four other scriptures, and I'm not going to read them. I want you to write these down, because this is your study this week. 
as you start examining what kind of a life and what kind of a trust you have. Because this is my application for you. I can't live your life for you. I can, frankly, I can't live my life for my wife or my children or my granddaughter. I can live my life for me and my faith and my hope in Him. In Matthew 28, or Matthew, Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Write that down. Turn to your Bible. Seek first the kingdom of God. Turn to Jesus, who is the rescuer for all inheritance and all things. That's why I would also write down 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, who says in that way, and you can read that for yourself when he says the investment and the inheritance that now comes to the one who invests in him. Write down this verse and live this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. In that way, he just talks about the builder. It's a picture of this builder. He builds this life of all these things. But if you build it out of these material, when the fire comes, guess what's left? Nothing. The only thing that remains when the fire is done is the truth of the word of God. And that's the relationship that we can have in Christ. Which leads me to the last verse I want to write you down. And that is Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. In fact, a whole chapter 8. Because it speaks to that, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, guys, I want you to understand, Christ Jesus is the only bridge from the desert to the garden. That's why Jesus came. God looked down on us as humanity and recognized how broken of a world that we lived in. And we were constantly trying to build our own towers of personal strength. And they were towers that were built with hay, stubble, and straw. And when the fire comes, it goes away. You can't build a personal life big enough. This is why we preach about Jesus Christ. Now, granted, I was preaching out of the Old Testament. But the answer of, the, of all of this is comes when you trust your life. In God's answer, God's Son, Jesus Christ. That is the only survival rate. That's my lesson for today. Spend your week examining these scripture and examining your own heart. Where do you want to live? What kind of a person are you? Person one or person two? I'm going to pray and we're going to worship together for just a minute. Pray with me for just a minute. Almighty God, again, I want to reach out to all of our friends and our church family and even others out there who really are struggling right now. And, and they recognize that we built our, we spend so much of our time building a life that just is that hood, that, that wood, hay, and stubble, and it just doesn't last. God, the only hope that we can have is the living hope that comes from you, the truth, the life. Jesus Christ, our Lord, I want to pray that right now some of us could just say, I want to open up my heart and my life. I'm not perfect. I'm not, you haven't got all things together or figured out, but I want to open it up to you, God. I want to open up my heart and life to you. Thank you, God, for giving us the answer, giving us a relationship that, that we can only have by faith, not by doing, but by trusting in you, the answer. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind, I lift up this prayer. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today and joining in. And uh, we're going to, uh, have a time of prayer, and, and we're going to sing one more song. But first, I'd also just like to remind you, especially for those that, that call Lifeway home and that ordinarily would be here and support the ministries of this church. Billy mentioned it earlier, but, you know, without you being here doesn't, doesn't mean that we still don't need the tithes and offerings that help support our missionaries around the world. Uh, we do have commitments to missionaries. We give to them every month around the world. Those are in, in different parts of this globe that are that are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are supporting our, our staff here, continuing to support them with their full time, uh, with their salaries and, and, and their wages. So I just want to pray and ask that you uh, take the time, if you would, to go on LifeWayConnect.com. There are lots of ways that you can give online there through the Tithely app. You can do that way. Set yourself up uh, for just uh, recurring giving or a one-time gift, whatever you can do. Please uh, continue to do that with your tithes and offerings in that way and worship in that way with us. Um, and right now, we're just going to spend a little bit of time in prayer, um, praying for our country, our leaders, um, certainly those that are impacted the most by this, where the 
folks that work in the restaurant business, uh, the airline business, um, other places around the world, small businesses and around the, our city that are, that are shuttering, uh, that are closing up and that don't know what, if they're going to be able to come back. There are a lot of things going on, but I do pray also, just pray for folks that you know, that you will allow your light and your hope and your foundation and security in Jesus Christ to be able to, to share that with others around you during this time. So if you would right now, whether you're um, in your living room or your bedroom or wherever you are, take a couple of minutes to pray, and then I will uh, close us here in just a couple of minutes. So why don't you spend some time in prayer? Heavenly Father, it's times like these, a lot of times we have, we don't have words. We, it, it's hard to know how to pray, what to pray for. But God, you tell us in your word that if we just open ourselves up to you, you will help us, Lord. You'll intercede. Your Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf. And God, I pray that as we spend time, more time in prayer over these next several days and weeks, that you will do that, Lord. You will just bring up those things that we need to pray for, those people that we need to, to lift up in prayer, those businesses around us. God, right now, I, I pray for those that you have put into a position of authority and a position of power and, and those that are our leaders right now. Because, again, we know that sometimes we don't agree with everything that goes on. We certainly don't. We all have our own opinions and and. and from a politics standpoint or from just a personal view standpoint. But right now, God, we know that the leaders that are that have authority, you put in that position. And you put them there for a very special reason. And so right now, I pray that you be with them, Lord, and, and give them each the wisdom that they need to make the right decisions in the face of this crisis. That you allow them to hear from you, Lord, that you change them from the inside out. Lord, I know that many of these leaders have no idea who you really are. But we pray that through this, they understand your wisdom, your power, your love for them and for others around them. But give them, just give them the right answers, Lord. That's what we need right now. For those doctors, for those nurses, for the, anyone in the healthcare industry right now that are just so overworked um, and in such harm's way in a way, I pray that you be with them, those that work at, that that uh, that are in our church family, Lord, who are in that in that industry. I pray that you protect them and you be with them and give them the perseverance and the strength that they need to take care of those that are coming in. Lord, I pray for those who are out of work right now because I know there are some in our church. I pray that you give them the hope and assuredness, Lord, that you are there for them, no matter what, no matter what, and that you're going to take care of them. Lord, I pray that uh, the small businesses that are, that are having to close their doors, I pray that you give them your assurance, Lord, and, and your peace 
Lord, um, and I pray for those who are sick and those whose families have lost loved ones through this. I pray that, God, you um, just heal those that are sick. And, and truly, we pray for you to take this virus completely out. Just wipe it out, Lord. And um, we, we do pray for that. And, and just, but in all of this, Lord, in all this time where we're not, we're just, we're, we're not busy. It's kind of weird. We're not busy. And, um, you know, a lot of times when we ask each other, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just really busy. It's hard to say that right now. And um, this time of just calm and peace, and it, it's such an interesting time. So I pray that we remember this and we take this, Lord, and we say, gosh, we need to build more of this in our lives, even when things do start to go back to normal. Um, so, Lord, there's so many things to, to, to pray for during this time. And and I, I, God, I just help us, help us to see um, the truth in all of this, help us to be a light of hope for people around us who don't have any right now, and let our, just let us shine before, before our friends, our family, those that we do come into contact with, which I know is little right now, um, but Lord, just be with us. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for being a mighty God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for just being a God of love and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.